everybody. This is Anastasia, president of U.S. Harbors, and I'm thrilled to be here today with a solar sailor who has conquered some of the most extreme environments in her adventures. My name's Kirsten Neuschäfer, and I come from South Africa, and I also live in South Africa, but I'm currently living aboard Pelagic, uh, and Pelagic's a high-latitude expedition sailboat, and um, this boat is currently alongside in Maine, Thomaston. I love the ocean for one. I love surfing. I love being in the water. I'm a real water baby. And, um, and I love being out on the high seas um, because there's a definite sort of certain sense of peace. If you're doing a long crossing, like I spent many years doing offshore deliveries where we deliver boats from Cape Town, South Africa, over to wherever the owners wanted them. So it, it could have been um, the States or uh, South America or the Caribbean or Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, we went to all sorts of different destinations and the majority of these trips would take about two months and there's a definite sense of peace I find when you're on a long offshore passage like that and you really get into the rhythm and into the routine of, of a trip like that and um, yeah, I kind of got hooked, I got addicted, uh, you know, I love the, the challenges of it, you, you're invariably going to have challenges on the long passage because at some other stage, you're going to have, um, you know, rough weather or adverse weather. You're almost always going to have some sort of breakage. So you're always challenged to um, find solutions and to be resourceful. So I guess that's what I like about it. It, it challenges you and it, it forces you to, you know, bring out your full potential sometimes. You must have a, a very high tolerance for um, danger. I guess like, a lot of people would say that to me. Uh, for example, I've done other trips. You know, I also like land-based trips. I've done trips and stuff through Africa where people have said, why are you doing that on your own? You're crazy. That's super dangerous. Um, but I guess my idea of danger is possibly different because I spend so much time out at sea um, and doing these kind of trips. It feels kind of natural and normal to me, whereas I feel more threatened if I'm in a big city because I feel there's far more chance of having a car crash, for example, or, you know, running into some issues with a criminal or something like that and I do actually believe that statistically I'm probably safer out at sea than I am living in a, in a big city and also because when you're in expedition mode or you know long trip mode I think you actually uh, naturally start being a lot more careful because you realize if I twist my ankle now it might be a way bigger problem than if I did it you know somewhere in civilization so yeah so it's, it, I think it puts you on your on guard more. Currently, and I'm working on Pelagic, this really cool, relatively well-known high latitude expedition sailboat, and she belongs to Skip Novak, and Skip Novak's uh, quite a renowned adventurer, mountaineer, and especially sailing explorer, because he did some of the pioneering sailing, um, you know, already starting back 20 or 30 years ago, um, down in the southern latitudes around South Georgia and Antarctica on Pelagic. So I'm working for him and it's fantastic working for him because he's an absolute wealth of knowledge and this boat is absolutely 100% equipped to go to really far out places and also to really stormy places. So some of the features of this boat is she's a steel boat. So if you get into icy areas, you know, you can actually motor through ice, um, which you wouldn't do with a, a boat that weren't aluminium or steel. And she's got a super strong rig. So we can go into really stormy latitudes and expect that we'll be safe on this boat because she's so, so robust. And then she's got a whole lot of special features like a lifting keel and lifting rudder. Um, that's all to get into shallow bays or to get out of tricky situations um, where you're really, really far away and you can expect there to be absolutely no one to come and rescue you. So, um, so this boat in itself is a very, very self-sufficient boat. And uh, the kind of trips that we do on Pelagic, um, up until last year, we were still going down to the Antarctic Peninsula and to South Georgia. And we were mainly taking mountaineers on these sort of trips or scientists or um, film crew, you know, people wanting to make wildlife documentaries and then going to these very far flung places so that uh, they can do their, their film shoots. So yeah. Um, and basically I'm the skipper, so um, I go where the clients ask me to go and then within reasons of safety. So I'll take them wherever I can without endangering them or the vessel. 
So we know that you are um, going to the Golden Globe. So can you um, describe how you got interested in doing that and what that means? So the Golden Globe is um, it's a non-stop solo unassisted round the world race. And it's based on the first ever non-stop solo unassisted round the world race that took place in 1968. Um, and it's a retro race. So they're trying to um, make this race a replica of that first ever race, which means that uh, you, you can't use modern technology. You need to use the technology that existed in 1968. So in 1968, there was no GPS and there was no electronic autopilot and, um, and the boats that you're allowed racing on this race need also to conform to that era of boat. So it's kind of an old school design. Um, the boats need to predate 1988, but they all conform to that era. And they also, they're not allowed to be bigger than 36 foot. Um, yeah, so it means uh, doing things like celestial navigation and really relying on it like no modern sailor does. I mean, I've done it before, but I've done it, you know, every time I've done it, it's been for the fun to compare the position I get out of celestial navigation with the GPS position. It hasn't been because I'm really relying on it as they did back then. So that's pretty much the race in a nutshell. So you're not allowed going ashore. You're not allowed stopping on land. Uh, you need to keep going nonstop. So you need to have provisions enough for, for you know, however long the trip is going to take. And I think you need to almost plan on it being nine months or more. Um, you need to have thought of a, a rain catchment system because you obviously can't carry enough water for nine months. You know, so there's a lot of thought that goes into what do you need to be out at sea for that amount of time nonstop? I got interested in the Golden Globe race um, in 2018 when the 2018 Golden Globe was running. And I was following it not as closely as I would have liked to because I was down on sub-Antarctic islands and out of range of, of internet. But um, it was the first time that a race really appealed to me um, because, for example, I've never been particularly appealed to race in a Volvo Ocean race. Um, but this one really, really appeals to me, uh, firstly, primarily because it's a single-handed race and I really do like the solo challenges. But then um, also because it's a retro race and I love the fact that this race isn't about um, how high-tech your boat is um, and how athletic and precision a racing sailor you are but that it's more about really old school retro racing which to me takes the sailing back to its purest essence and it's for me it's not just a race about how good a sailor are you how fast a racer are you but it's a race of how good are you, is is your seamanship you know um, are you allowing things to break and when things break are you resourceful enough to uh, you know, find a solution to fix the problem and keep going. And how good are your storm tactics? Because, um, you know, the modern boats can sometimes outrun a very bad system that's coming up behind them. But on these retro boats that are 36 um, foot and no longer, you're not going to outrun a storm. So you're going to have to, it's a race of attrition. You're going to have to survive it. And so this race to me brings in so many different dynamics that some of the other races don't have. And that's why when this race started up again in 2018, I thought if I get a chance to do this race, there's no ways I wouldn't take it. Can you describe what now that you're preparing for the Golden Globe? What does that mean? Well, um, preparation for the Golden Globe is actually huge. I mean, the next race the one I've entered for is taking place in, um, it starts in September 2022, which you would think that gives me quite a bit of time, but I was actually one of the later entrants. Um, you know, most of the people that have um, entered the race now had already entered quite a long time before I had entered. So they're probably in some respects a little bit ahead of me in terms of preparation, because of course the big step is getting the boat and that in itself was a whole lot of preparation and doing the right kind of research speaking to the right kind of people uh, which means other racing sailors naval architects um, to find out of the permitted boats which is going to be a competitive boat because i'm not just entering the race to you know finish it because i i'm stand to correction but i believe there probably are two categories of people entering the one category wants to finish the race, 
which in itself is an achievement. But the other person, the other category of person wants to actually compete in the race and give their all and everything to try and win. And that's me. I really, really want to try and win. And I think from the outset, your preparation is different if you want to win. So um, having the right boat is paramount. You can't just have any boat and one that's sturdy, but maybe slow, it doesn't matter because you'll still get to the end. You want one that's sturdy for sure, because if it's not, uh, you, you might not survive or your boat might not survive the Southern Ocean so that you can even sail over the finish line. But you also want one that's, uh, you know, competitive in terms of its speed. So that was my first big step is to find the right kind of boat. And I eventually, after a lot of research and looking and even sailing on different types of boats, um, decided on the boat that I've purchased now that's in um, Newfoundland. It's, it's a Cape George 36 and it's very sturdy. But I think it's also um, competitive and I think it will do particularly well in, in the, the rough weather. And two thirds of the race is down in one of the world's stormiest oceans, that being the Southern Ocean. Um, and then the next step is huge refit work to the boat, because now I want to replace the whole rig and do a lot of work that's going to make the boat stronger. And I obviously need new sets of sails and all sorts of things. So the refit's going to be a huge step in it as well. And then there are certain um, qualifying requirements that you need to do in order to you know, tick all the boxes to actually be allowed to race. One of those is you need to um, sail for 2,000 miles on your own with your own boat. Um, and you need to do celestial navigation. So you, you can have a GPS on board, of course, but you need to come back with all your sights and show the race organizers that you actually did that entire um, trip with celestial navigation. And you need to have used a wind vane. And now wind vane is a self-steering gear, an old school self-steering gear that's not electronic. So you need to have done that trip with just a wind vane so that you can prove that you do actually know how to use it and that, and that you're up for it. So that's quite a big thing and it's going to be a good thing because it's going to get me ready for a lot of things and you know I'm going to learn my boat like that um, but I there's a lot of other stuff I want to do like I want to take the boat out into really extreme conditions and make sure I know how to um, uh, you know what sort of storm tactics I'm going to use when I get into those conditions and uh, the more I sail the boat the more I'll know what things I want to you know change on my boat or tweak to make it more user-friendly and, and safer um and then um just getting physically fit is a huge thing you know i don't want to go into the race being unfit so um as i get close to the time i definitely want to make sure that i'm on quite a strict fitness regime so that by the time um, i'm ready to race i'm also physically and, and mentally prepared in every way that i can be so what do you find most challenging about the mental health aspect of solo sailing i actually naturally fit into it quite well i mean i've um i have never done as long a trip as this you know where you're you know nine months alone at sea but um i've certainly been you know up to seven days on my own at sea and i don't find the lack of company that bad in fact i, I quite be, like being on my own but i think it becomes quite challenging when something breaks or goes wrong and you need to fix it and it would be so much easier to just have one extra pair of hands because they can pass you a thing or they can keep the boat on course or um, suddenly it becomes quite uh, yeah, challenging when you're all on your own. And then, you know, if you're really in a tricky situation where you're thinking this is a bit of a risk or this is quite a serious bit of breakage or we're getting into a situation that's starting to feel threatening, it's nice when you have another person for that moral support you know, um, that's, that's when it really becomes challenging. But um, generally, when things are going quite well, and when you've got everything under control, um, I just fit into the routine. I, I, and I, I don't know, this, this theory of mine stands to be proven, but I kind of feel that you get over a peak where, where you're not worried about being alone anymore, where you get so used to it that I almost don't think it should make too much of a difference whether, whether it's two months or whether it's nine months but like everything in life you're going to have your ups and downs and when you have the downs and you're on your own that's going to be a little bit more challenging I think. How do you feel about suddenly um, being a role model because certainly now that you're out there doing this you're you're uh, standing in front of a lot of people and a, a 
young girls will probably see you and, and uh, see this as something that's possible for them. Yeah, I, I must say it's it's quite daunting because um, I've never been on social media. I've been quite a low-key person all my life. I've really enjoyed anonymity <laughs> and I've been told there's no way around it. If you want to get to the start line of the Golden Globe, you're going to have to um, get a little bit in, into the um, media light. So, um, so yeah, it's it's really a whole new thing for me. And like I say, it is daunting. But on the other hand, I've been so blessed in this life to have uh, been able to have the adventures that I've had and um, go to the places that I've gone to. And um, if I manage to do this Golden Globe, which I'm very much counting on will be the case, then it's a huge, huge privilege. And if I'm so privileged, then I should be willing to share whatever experience I, I have with other people because I've certainly had people in my life that have uh, motivated me and inspired me and if I can you know motivate and inspire other people then I, I feel it's my duty and then I take that on very gladly. Well super nice to meet you I hope we get to meet in person sometime and um yeah, yeah it's very nice to meet you. thanks for your time and your interest I appreciate it yeah <laughs> but a bit of marketing for me yeah <laughs> definitely yeah. absolutely so we'll be in touch okay for sure thanks so much have a good day still bye-bye